Hello, welcome to GeoBytes, your daily roundup of news from geospatial industry. I'm your host, Bhanu Rekha. For the next 15 minutes, I will bring you the news of the top developments across projects, products, policies, and business. But first, let's take a look at the top story today. Researchers at the University of California, Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory have come up with a way to detect wildfires at an early stage using satellites and drones. Called the Fire Urgency Estimator in Geosynchronous Orbit or FUGO, the system is designed to spot wildfires in the western US in just three minutes after they start. Though the system is a theoretical framework at this point, once it is fully operational, it would enable aerial tankers to attack a new fire within 20 minutes. Imagine that. Well, let us also tell you how the system works. A satellite fitted with an infrared camera would monitor fire-prone areas of the country and relay its data to a geospatial information system on the ground. Besides, drones mounted with cameras would patrol high-risk areas to get high-resolution pictures. These cameras would snap photos in a 3.9 microband, a wavelength of light emitted by fires which is invisible to the naked eye. A computer model would detect differences in the photos to determine if a new fire has erupted. Here's what Carl Pennypacker, US Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley research physicist and lead coordinator for FUGO has to say. Tremendously rich sensors, tremendously rich computing power, uh, you know, modern telecommunications. After all, California is, is, the, is the center of this, of, of the whole planet. Why don't, why, why don't we apply some of this to uh, fires? And uh, my colleagues and I, I think, put together something quite reasonable, quite cheap, and we're testing at various levels right now, working with, working with various parts. Uh, we have some staff in Cal Fire we're working with, some in the in the National U.S. Forest Service. So I think we're slowly evolving into a solution. I think again, we, the technology is revolutionary, but the implementation is going to be evolutionary. It can take as long as six more years to get a satellite in space and make the system operational, but it would save the nation millions in dam damages. Berkeley researchers suggest that the satellite could be built and operated by the federal government like the Geostationary Operational Environment Satellite. It could even be a partnership between government and the private sector like the Landsat Satellite Program. And, and through building this satellite would cost several hundred million dollars, it would still be a fraction of the nation's 2.5 billion annual firefighting budget. In another development, Spatial Data and Insight company GeoDigital has collaborated with an energy industry specialist to launch an online calculator. This new tool provides an estimate of the potential financial benefit utilities can avail if they move from human-based vegetation inspection to digital-based patrolling. The calculator estimates that by using remote sensing technology, including LiDAR and high-definition imagery collected at regular intervals, the North American utility industry can save over $1 billion and reduce the risk of vegetation-related outages. The savings come in the form of reduced vegetation management cost, more accurate and competitive contractor bids, and selective use of herbicides. Also from the world of electric utilities, Think Power Solutions has released a program management and business intelligence portal called Think Power One. The platform would provide utilities with SaaS-based GIS integrated and mobile-ready tools and analytics to manage project documents, collect data from the field, view project progress and gain business intelligence through real-time project dashboards. Hari Vasudevan, co-founder of Think Power Solutions, says that the new solution addresses key challenges in the utility industry. These include aged assets, documentation management, and inadequate geospatial and visual representation of assets with real-time project management tools. Moving on, oil and gas ArcGIS platform specialist 
Exprodat has re released version 222 of Exploration Analyst, a tool that helps exploration departments understand opportunities and make better decisions. This version provides a host of new tools for exploration staff to improve their play assessment analysis. Exprodat's technical director Chris Cheps explains that the primary focus of the latest release is on extending and enhancing its yet-to-find tools by providing more flexibility and streamlining analysis across multiple areas. The release also adds the ability to analyze feature densities and discovered pools by hydrocarbon phase. In another software development, the latest version of the web-based Leica cross-check for GNSS reference station network integrity and deformation monitoring now comes with enhanced visualization and reporting options. Experts at Leica Geosystems process monitoring data using the latest geodetic software and algorithms. They provide precise assessments of any site movement on various types of infrastructure platforms such as oil platforms, bridges or dams. Users can easily distribute customizable automatically generated reports to multiple viewers via email. The new versions dashboard and status view features enable fast interpretation of complex data of reference network coordinates and area deformation. Avenza Systems, a Canadian company which creates mapping and GIS software products compatible with the Adobe Creative Suite, has released a new geospatial image editing platform. The Geographic Imager 5.0 for Adobe Photoshop is a georeference tool which has been redesigned to provide flexibility while referencing and rectifying images. It is compatible with Adobe Photoshop Creative Cloud 2015 for both Windows and Mac. This release also introduces the Map Package Export feature compatible with the PDF Maps mobile app. It also allows users to upload the map packages directly to the PDF Maps Digital Map Store. Geographic Imager 5.0 is available immediately. It is free of charge to all current Geographic Imager maintenance program members. Avenza's Director of Sales and Marketing, Doug Smith, will now tell you more about the product. What you can do is you can take any kind of, let's say, geotiffs, any kind of uh, reference imagery, and a lot of people at this show bring it into Photoshop, because Photoshop's such a premier tool right. for working with imagery. Mm -hmm. And let's say they want to knock out cloud cover or change any pixels in there. Well, the big problem with doing it in Photoshop with a mm -hmm. referenced image is as soon as you change anything in there, the referencing shot, it's gone. I want to pass it over to somebody. I can't use it now as a referenced image. We allow you to maintain that referencing when you kick it out of Photoshop. Mm -hmm. But we also have tools that allow you to crop, tile, mosaic these images, change projections, a whole bunch of tools in there to really get the image that people want. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people in this industry utilize that because, of again, it's the same idea as a map publisher. We're okay. turning Photoshop into a little spatial imaging tool for referencing. Okay, we will now slip into a short break, but when we return, we will have a look at developments from Africa and South Asia. Geospatial industry is evolving with time, adding newer dimensions, converging with other technologies, and expanding across verticals. Feel the pulse of its growth story. Cash technology innovators, system integrators, business drivers, and policy makers share their knowledge, experiences, and ideas at GeoBiz Leaders Summit. Join the knowledge pool.
Welcome back. Reports are coming in from India that officials from the country's Home Ministry recently met Google representatives. It seems the government is now planning to give Google permission to put 3D imagery of Indian metropolitan areas in Google Earth. Many of you may have already seen 3D imagery of metro cities of the United States, the UK, Brazil and Australia in the geolocation software. Well, the latest version of Google Earth is designed to provide an immersive 3D experience to the users. For this feature, Google uses imagery depicting a location from a 45 degree angle rather than from the top. It is quite useful in understanding driving directions or to check out a place you are about to visit for the first time. This seems like a good time to show you 3D imagery of San Francisco in Google Earth 7. Beautiful, isn't it? In another development, the Ramani Huria, a web-based project funded by the World Bank, is currently training students and local community members to create maps of flood-prone areas in the Tanzania city of Dar es Salaam. The maps are being created using an open-source platform called OpenStreetMap. University students have been taught using of field papers, GPS units and OSM trackers to create well detailed maps. The community members believe that digital mapping is essential for keeping current records for the future generations. It should be noted that at least 38 people were killed when the African nation was hit by floods this March. Also from Africa, the United Nations Regional Center for Mapping of Resources and Development has joined hands with national agencies of Malawi to keep or to develop a comprehensive national hazards and vulnerability atlas for the entire country. This atlas and GIS database form an important part of the steps the government of Malawi is taking in its national disaster risk management policy. The project is being carried out with support from the server program, a joint program between NASA and USAID. A workshop held in Malawi last week to validate hazard and vulnerability maps against local knowledge. That's all we have for you in GeoBytes today. Find us on www.geobiz.com and follow GeoBiz on Twitter. We will be back shortly with GeoBiz exclusive. Stay tuned. Once again, Trimble is leading the way in positioning technology with the new Trimble R8S GNSS receiver. An entirely new way to look at receiver possibilities. Simply choose the configuration and features you require today. Then, add features as you need them tomorrow. It's the ultimate in scalability. With this innovative receiver, you tailor your system to your job, to the way you work. Choose the level of configuration that suits your needs. As your requirements change, the Trimble R8S can adapt. You simply add functionality whenever you want it. Each Trimble R8S comes standard with integrated Maxwell 6 chips, Trimble 360 tracking technology, and more. All to keep you productive and expand the reach of your GNSS system. Plus, it offers our exclusive web UI for remote monitoring and the new Trimble DL Android app 
for GNSS data logging. And the Trimble R8S maximizes productivity by easily integrating with the Trimble S-Series total stations and our innovative V10 imaging rover. For ultimate field efficiency, combine the Trimble R8S receiver with a Trimble controller and the intuitive Trimble access field software. Trust Trimble Business Center to help you edit, process, and adjust your data. It's the kind of solution you have come to expect from Trimble. We've been setting the standard in positioning technology for more than 30 years. See how we're raising the bar again with the Trimble R8S GNSS receiver. Can you tell us a little, a little bit about uh, GEO and what it is that you do in the organization? We have a lot of obviously formidable competitors in the mapping space. But saying Human Geo, I was like uh, perplexed why the name Human to the geospatial angle. If we think about land, I mean land is a key core to prosperity. Thank you Hugo for speaking with the GeoBiz and Geospatial World. The first and foremost requirement for any developed country is organizing its land. So any initiatives in organizing its land? Malaysia's vision is to become a developed country by 2020. To be a developed country, there are many issues that need to be addressed, such as uh, the environment. Now, in uh, developing rapidly, especially physical development. Naturally, the environment can be degraded if uh, stricter control is not instituted. So it is very important that the control of development, physical development, is necessary in order to maintain the quality of the environment so that the environment is not degraded too much. Even a little degradation means that we have to undertake mitigation measures in order to ensure that the quality remains or at least the quality is taken care of because the quality of the environment is or offers conducive situation for us, the uh, general public or the population of the country to live in. How NRE Ministry is using GIS or remote sensing technologies so that the environment is conserved and taken care of? In Malaysia, it is the problem of inaccessibility. When uh, you have problem of inaccessibility, then monitoring of the environment takes time to do. So when it takes time for you to do monitoring, then uh, the use of geospatial technology is important, such as GIS, satellite images, and uh, all the other technologies that are available under your special in order to uh, institute rehabilitation or putting mitigation measures to ensure that the uh, quality of the environment is maintained or the environment itself is rehabilitated. This is uh, for the benefits of the people. When the quality of the environment uh, later on is instituted, then the people will find that the environment in a certain area is 
already taken care of. What are the latest initiatives uh, you had uh, instituted uh, uh, so that uh, JUPEM, uh, with its uh, national mapping and services, is able to contribute in a much more uh, active way to the development of Malaysia? What we do is to upgrade mm -hmm. JUPEM mm -hmm. in terms of it, its functions. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to upgrade JUPEM in terms of its function is, we have to provide JUPEM with equipment and uh, other facilities. Without equipment, the necessary facilities, then it would be difficult to upgrade JUPEM. So, once JUPEM is upgraded, then uh, the next move is to uh, train the people working in JUPEM. How do you intend to upgrade JUPEM? To upgrade JUPEM, like I said, is to provide the necessary equipment, okay. like drone, mm -hmm. LIDAR equipment, mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. so that uh, the production of maps will be much easier for them to do. Mm -hmm. Because JUPEM does mapping, mm -hmm. and the maps are needed mm -hmm. by uh, different people in different fields. So if this happens, then uh, to expedite the processing of data and also at the end of it is to produce maps to be used by different people is quicker or rapid than uh, <clears throat> what JUPEM is doing now. That's why uh, starting from next year, JUPEM will get allocations from the government mm -hmm. in order to get some of these equipment mm -hmm. that are necessary for uh, JUPEM to function efficiently. And Malaysia is also developing a spatial data infrastructure, MACD, right? So uh, what is the progress of making this uh, spatial data infrastructure a reality? We have data but our data are not integrated. Yeah. So when the data are not integrated, then data sharing is difficult. We are trying to integrate data that are available and to collect more data and integrate them so that we can manage the data effectively and efficiently. And at the end of it all is to share the data with uh, whatever ministries that want the data or departments that want the data, including the general public. This is very important because data are not easy to come by. And therefore, MACD under my ministry is trying its best to collect data and avail this data to interested parties for their uses. Now, the inability or refusal of other departments to share data is that they always claim that their data are restricted or their data are kept under secrecy. Therefore, if the data are kept under secrecy, then they are not data for public usage. When they are not data for public usage, that is where the difficulty lies. It is therefore necessary for any other departments to determine what data are uh, secret data and what are not. Secret data, they can keep the data by themselves until those data are no longer secret, then they can uh, release those data or give the data to us on the one platform. Is Malaysian government uh, formulating some policies uh, to mandate uh, the sharing of data? Policies are important uh, to mandate the sharing of data. But for the time being, there is no proposal in sight to come up with any policy at all to mandate the sharing of data. So uh, it has been, it has to be brought in in a meeting, in ministerial meeting, mm -hmm. 
so that uh, it can be done to mandate the sharing of data. You see, Malaysia is uh, a federation with uh, 13 states and uh, of federal territory. Now, the interests of states are different from the interests of the federal government. Under the constitution of Malaysia, land, forests, and inland waters or rivers are under the jurisdiction of states. It is therefore the state interest also to look into matters like this. So the state, some states, even refuse to share data with us. So uh, this is also our difficulty, especially in times of natural disasters. If states refuse to share data with us, so how can we ever predict or how can uh, we mitigate natural disasters? So this is, this is very important that states also must work together with the federal government in order for the federal government to institute changes and mitigation measures to some of those natural disasters that can happen and that will happen, such as big floods. You, you have invited uh, the industry in the morning uh, to come to Malaysia, technology companies, services companies to come and uh, invest in Malaysia to do business in Malaysia. Uh, is Malaysia and uh, the Malaysian federal government willing to do, uh, willing to work in a public-private partnership mode as well? Because any success of the project is uh, uh, dependent uh, on both the parties. So a partnership, an equal partnership, will always ensure uh, a success in a much better way. It is important that they come with high-value technologies mm -hmm. and high-value services that are available for them. Yeah. In fact, they are already in Malaysia. Many of them are already yes. in Malaysia. Yeah. When I went through the exhibition, I spoke to them. Mm. All of them. Most of them said they have a partner in Malaysia already. Uh -huh. But of course, <clears throat> as a policy, as one of policy makers and decision makers, then uh, it is always my desire to invite them so that they come with the latest technology. They will bring in the latest technologies with, because they have already partners in Malaysia. Therefore, it is important that if they come, then they will continue to work with the partners in Malaysia and their partners will uh, work with the government. The partners will talk to, to the government on what they have on, and on what they can do. And of course, the government will also look into the cost of the services and technologies that are available that can expedite and enhance decision making within the government. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for sharing your valuable insight with us. Thank you. Hello.
Welcome back to GeoBiz, industry upbeat live panel discussion. We all know 29 years, it has been 29 years that the first set of micro satellites have been launched by Soviet Union in 1986 and since then small satellites have become even smaller and more sophisticated. Well, uh, the advances in uh, microelectronics, micro GNSS, and a vast array of LE technologies is facilitating reducing the costs of manufacturing and launching of the satellites. And this has uh, given, opened up uh, the market completely with new and uh, uh, a new set of uh, people joining uh, the satellite, small satellite business uh, and taking the opportunities forward. So uh, not just uh, in the communications, earth observation, weather, education, the, you name and there is a scope for small satellites to play a role. So to discuss on the trends in the small satellites and the application areas, we have an esteemed panel today in the studio and I introduce uh, Annie Milgrace, uh, uh, President and CEO of Planet IQ. Thank you, uh, Annie, for joining uh, us on GeoBuzz live panel discussion. Annie has been uh, uh, has been a geographer and remote sensing scientist by training, and she has has about she has about more than thirty years of experience in geospatial sector and space sector. She has also worked with Booz Allen uh, and uh, Fugro Earth Data and other companies uh, before moving to Planet IQ. And on my left, we have. We have uh, Frank McKenna, President, Satellite and Services Division, Omni Earth. Frank also has more than 30 years of experience uh, in aerospace, electronics, space, and IT businesses. He has worked with organizations like Lockheed Martin and International Launch Services before moving to Omni Earth. Welcome, uh, Frank. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us on GeoBiz. And uh, to start with the uh, panel discussion, Annie, can I ask you to introduce about your company, what Omni Earth is doing and how it is taking the small satellite business forward? Sure, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, inviting me today. Uh, Planet IQ will launch the world's first uh, constellation of small sats entirely focused on weather and improving the weather forecast globally. You know, every soul on Earth deserves a great weather forecast and pretty much every business wants one. Um, so we are looking to launch our first two in the third quarter of next year, followed by 10 in 2017, with a specific type of technology called GPS radio occultation. Um, and this data in particular has been found to be very useful in improving global forecasts, particularly in parts of the world that are, you know, actually undersampled now. Um, that would be Africa, that would be India, much of the developing world. But the data are valuable, you know, globally to driving a much better forecast. Okay, thank you so much mm -hmm. uh, for the introduction. Uh, uh, Frank, can I ask you, can I request you to tell us more about uh, Omni Earth and its activities with small satellite domain? Certainly. Uh, Omni Earth is a company that's been formed to do uh, big data analytics and have provisioning through satellites and other sensor data, mm -hmm. largely to serve uh, multiple markets around the globe. Uh, there is a trend toward the utilization of geospatial information to convert that information into solutions. That's why Omni Earth was formed. We focus very specifically on the provisioning of unique data sets uh, in the case of the satellite constellation that Omni Earth is constructing. It will be a global constellation for the provisioning of medium resolution, uh, panchromatic and multi-resolution, uh, uh, multi-spectral data on a temporal resolution of every day. So what that really is trying to do is bring a level of uh, information that is current and can be used in multiple sectors to produce solutions to customers that uh, need that type of information to solve some of their largest problems. Okay, thank you so much. That gives a pretty good uh, understanding of what Omni Earth does and uh, what Planet IQ does. Uh, yes, uh, definitely, uh, just special, a small satellite is a trend. And you can understand what, according to you, what is your impressions about why this trend has catching up and what has facilitated this uh, trend? 
in the first place? Well, I, I think it's catching up for uh, a lot of great business reasons, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that it is now possible to uh, manufacture these satellites um, that are equally as reliable, depending on the application, uh, for a lot less money. Um, in our case, we've been through three separate designs of the satellite, um, and finally we have arrived at a design that also has the appropriate risk-reward, uh, as, as you would put it, for what it's going to cost to fly it. Um, in the three designs, we've gone down dramatically in weight and in cost, mm -hmm. um, not only to build the satellites, but then also to launch them. And there's the tremendous amount of technology innovation that's occurring in the engineering and manufacturing of these satellites. Um, and certainly we've drafted off of those um, accomplishments. Uh, we just recently announced that we've signed our bus manufacturer, a company called Blue Canyon Technologies, out of Boulder, Colorado, um, with an excellent uh, pedigree, if you will, of building CubeSats. Uh, we actually will be in a 6U form, so it's larger than your average CubeSat, but we're able to produce these much faster um, at much less cost than, say, a traditional uh, satellite that most people think of. We're down to under 15 kilograms. We have been as high as 135 kilograms. And when you look at the cost of launch, um, every kilogram that you save is saving you tens of thousands of dollars. So I think we've really benefited at Planet IQ from the innovation generally that's going on uh, in the satellite market. I think the other thing that is a driving factor here is what you can finance and what uh, the largely venture capitalists in Silicon Valley are willing to finance. Um, what we see is an explosion in the 3U satellite form um, very inexpensive uh, satellites and to some degree viewed as um, disposable, really. Um, we at Planet IQ have not taken that approach. Uh, we don't view them as disposable. We have a seven-year design life on ours. We have uh, propulsion on board, um, and so we um, have uh, gone up the value chain a little bit on uh, building a more robust satellite, I would say. But the venture capital community is really um, very detail-oriented, and, and they also want to weigh their risk-reward on the amount of money they're willing to put forward and what it costs to build these instruments. Um, so I think technology and the availability of capital really are, are driving this. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, as Annie has pointed out, every, ca every kilogram that is reduced is uh, saving in tens and thousands mm -hmm. of uh, dollars for launching and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Frank, how has been Omiel's experience uh, in building the satellites? What kind of technology innovations have helped you? Well, all of the types of innovations that Anne was referring to are a benefit to everyone who is uh, looking at putting up a satellite constellation. I think uh, the founders at OmniEarth had uh, really pretty much a different vision in terms of all of the devices that can provide uh, information and data to fuel an analytics solution to solve problems. So the satellite constellation is very important in our data provisioning and the types of data streams that we'll be providing to uh, customers. But we re receive uh, data information from all sources of information, aerial uh, sensors, uh, social media, uh, demographic information, uh, and it's the fusing of that information into the solutions that really counts. So as we progress, as the company executes its strategic plan, Three years from now, we'll launch uh, a constellation of 15 satellites, 18 within orbit spares. These are slightly larger than the ones Anne described, but they have a different capability. Uh, it's actually an optical telescope uh, with uh, multispectral sensors for bringing in uh, high quality, scientifically calibrated data that will allow uh, analytics to be performed in a temporal way and through the combination of that with other uh, information, very unique problems can be solved. Secondly, the satellite will also contain hosted payload cap capacity, which in this case, uh, it's approximately a 300 kilogram satellite and about 80 uh, kilograms is reserved for hosted payload capability. 
That can be other sensors, that can be communications devices, it can be things that work in conjunction with our system. So we're capitalizing on the advent of the same technologies that Ann talked about, only in a little bit larger uh, format for the type of coverage we want, which is actually a global, everyday, everywhere coverage. Okay, uh, just to get to the basics, uh, what is the specific need for having a, uh, such huge number of uh, uh, satellites and have a constellation together? Uh, well, I think uh, the trend toward uh, the global coverage is uh, there. The actual quantity of satellites in this case is not really that large. It's 15 satellites mm -hmm. in the sense of many other constellations, famous constellations such as Iridium or 77 with its spares. Uh, the uh, most uh, recent communications uh, constellation was announced, OneWeb, will be 700 satellites. So the quantity of satellites and the purpose and the function that's actually going on is really what is geared toward it. Uh, so we don't view our constellation to be an extremely large number of satellites in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, and my next question goes to you. You talked about uh, how, uh, how, uh, how uh, cautious the venture capital community are becoming in terms of uh, the risk, in terms of the cost implications uh, and other things. Uh, how how uh, you as a company are able to uh, convince him about uh, the proposition and the reliability of this kind of constellation? Yeah, so I think um, in our case we have some unique um, uh, obstacles, challenges, opportunities to overcome in that there are no private weather satellites anywhere exactly. in the world and the most important thing uh, in a business is, is one of the most important is certainly the market. Uh, we know that the world's global forecast agencies want to buy this data, we, they want to use this data, they want as much of this particular type of data as they can get. The world's premier weather forecasting organization, the European Commission for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, said that you could have 130,000 occultations a day, mm -hmm. uh, which is roughly 50 satellites worth of, of uh, data, um, and still not saturate the global forecast models. Um, the world now, the major forecast centers around the globe want as much of this as they can possibly get. The issue is they've never bought it before. They all buy data at present, they buy land-based data, uh, and they buy aircraft-based data. But from satellites, that transition has not yet occurred. Um, I used to work for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I worked there at the time when the commercial imagery world was trying to come out of the ground, uh, before there was a digital globe or an omni-Earth or any of the others. And the intelligence community was not the least bit excited about allowing this commercial entity uh, to come out of the ground and start to provide imagery uh, around the world. Um, but they found themselves in a situation very akin to the situation today that NOAA finds itself in and the global forecast agencies. And that is that we have a gap in coverage for weather satellites. Those weather satellites have gotten exceptionally expensive, billions of dollars a piece. True. Their build cycles are 13 years long and there's no ability to innovate. Um, and at that time that was called the future imagery architecture. That constellation was desperately behind schedule and, and over budget. And um, the leadership of the intelligence community said, well, you know, maybe we should be working with the imagery providers, the commercial imagery providers. We're starting to see that same transition. It's a behavioral transition occur uh, in the weather satellite business. So we know there's a demand for the data, we just know that there's a cultural impediment <coughs> uh, to buying the data. Presently, the globe spends about six billion dollars a year on weather satellites. Um, so there's plenty of budget out there to support one, two, three, four commercial companies. It's actually, I would argue, a bigger market than selling imagery is. Um, it is a, is a bigger market and will prove to be. And I think the, the downstream analytics as well are, are huge uh, from these data sets. What we see out of the venture capital community is, you know, they'd like to get a little more comfortable with the market and the buyer behavior. Um, uh, but they're willing to, you know, they see a, a home run here and they're willing to uh, invest, much like they have recently in a, a number of imagery companies, whether it was Skybox or Planet Labs or uh, Black Sky. I mean, there, there are a whole host of uh, really innovative companies coming out of the ground now. So 
yeah. I think they're they're willing to step forward. Okay, uh, that's a uh, that's a good piece uh, of information because uh, Earth observation uh, satellite uh, for a small satellite as a uh, uh, as a means uh, has uh, has a proven uh, market, but uh, I think uh, uh, for the weather satellite, the market is yet to be proven. And uh, right. it, but the potential is humongous, I guess. That's well, and we're also seeing a lot of innovation in weather forecasting in particular. So you're seeing the growth of companies like the Weather Channel, like mm -hmm. AccuWeather, like Japan Weather News, like the Meteo Group. Those companies are now doing their own numerical weather prediction, uh, which means they have an ingest cycle for that numerical weather prediction and an assimilation technique, and they can use this type of data as well. So we're not constrained just to government markets. Yes. Uh, we will also be selling into commercial markets. And I think you're going to see that commercial sector grow dramatically over the next 10 years. You know, the Earth's atmosphere is just a finite element model, and it's one that we dramatically undersample now. Mm -hmm. um, and so to the extent that we're seeing the, the increased power in compute platforms and better algorithms and better research, fundamental research, uh, supplying better observations, faster, a lot more of them, and being able to innovate in that space should drive a dramatically better weather forecast. Okay, fantastic. Uh, uh, Frank, moving to you, uh, the small satellites have been uh, already in the process of uh, sending out uh, uh, Earth observation imagery, and uh, how do you see the data can be used, but what kind of applications can be, uh, can this data be used uh, along with the analytics and uh, get to a, a more action-based uh, information? Well, our uh, business plan uh, actually goes across an existing market for medium resolution information. This information has been used uh, for many years. However, it has not had the same type of consistency and temporal resolution and focus that needs to be there to provide uh, really good coverage and uh, filling in the gaps, as Ann said. Uh, to uh, serve uh, various types of markets. So the types of products that we uh, are going uh, with really go into commercial markets like agriculture, energy, uh, utilities, uh, civil governments, and uh, it is more of a business-to-business -business, uh, type of, uh, of uh, business model. We do have U.S. government uh, as part of the business plan, but it's a small part. Uh, the growth is largely in the commercial sector, and that's where the promise is. And several of the uh, critical pro products that are actually on the front end of this uh, analytics drive really have to do with recently we uh, introduced a series of products uh, that address the continuing crisis and drought in California. These products uh, allow the uh, various water districts, there's 400 different water districts in California. It allows them to understand parcel by parcel what the utilization of water is, why it is what it is, what the budgeting and rate uh, uh, structure should be, data that has not been provided heretofore. And this is largely being captured by existing uh, satellite imagery as well as aerial imagery and other information that comes from uh, vast data sources that the state has, the municipal water districts have, and uh, by combining that with uh, companies and teaming with companies that are experts in indoor water use, we add land classification and feature extraction and a set of algorithms that allows for very precise prediction and understanding of the water utilization. That allows for the proper uh, programs to be put in place to address, for example, in this case, a drought and water crisis. In agriculture, similar types of methodologies are used by the engine that we have, but we tailor the application from that engine to directly looking at crop yield predictions, uh, different types of crops, different types of distress, uh, and the like. These are classic applications that have been provided but what is uh, unique is really the uh, large data set computations that are afforded by really data scientists now and cloud computing that can bring that set of solutions to the market rather quickly and solve problems quickly. So it is a really exciting time to be uh, looking at this type of uh, uh, market and then adding through really expertise in the sensors and the types of sensors that should be provided 
and where to collect that data and how to actually integrate it into the analytic solutions that is really what our company is set up to do. So we're not limited to just this satellite constellation or this set of sensors or this one type of data. Uh, we go across the, the board, including uh, probably someday being a, a customer of Planet IQ with Anne for weather information. Considering that uh, Omni Earth is uh, is using the small satellite data and also a, uh, any data required for creating more solutions, uh, how do you see uh, how uh, how competitive or how uh, uh, good is the small data from the small satellites vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the data that you obtain from the larger satellites and the conventional satellites, and how a mishmash of uh, these two imageries can be. Uh, very seamlessly brought in together for effective solutions? Well, that's a very uh, important question. Uh, I, it, I think it's more of an ecosystem, mm -hmm. uh, and there are many different types of capabilities that are brought to bear by satellite technology. Um, if you were to look at um, transportation, for example, there are semi-tractor trailers and there are Mini Coopers, and so uh, they provide a whole series of transportation functions uh, tailored to the types of needs that you have. The technology has changed, so actually there were very large satellites built in the 70s and 80s and 90s for the government. They were governed by the shuttle cargo bay. That was, that was actually what governed the limit, and so the idea was for the amount of capital that was going to be invested in those systems, you would put the maximum amount of uh, capability. You can only build five or six or seven of those systems. True. Then came the advent of a telecommunications market with commercial geos. These satellites uh, are six metric tons. Uh, there's hundreds of those, not six, not 10, but there's hundreds of those. They were governed by the most uh, capability that commercial launch providers could provide in a five meter fairing to that. So the idea then was to maximize the amount of electronics you could put in there and maximize the amount of coverage you could have to deliver and transport communication and bandwidth. Small satellites have come and they go to hundreds or thousands now. And the functions that they perform are quite a bit different, sometimes similar. But the temporal resolution and the, the rapidity of putting up different sensors quickly and the resilience of the network is really what is starting to be an advantage that. But if you think about it, where did all this come from? That, that will not scale to uh, billions, millions or billions, whereas these have, uh, yeah. smartphones have scaled to billions now. And within here, there are sensors, there's uh, two, uh, you know, two, uh, uh, cameras, there's a microphone, there's an accelerometer, there's a GPS receiver, a cellular receiver, an infrared uh, device port on it. And uh, so when you think about the, the electronics that are actually going into satellites, this is where it has been driven by that scale has allowed that to occur. So the next thing that we see in this is really part of what's called the Internet of Things. And that gets to, this is not scalable to trillions. So you would want trillions of sensors, actually, if you're going to monitor everything in the world, and that includes the use of satellites. So as you bring this down to uh, nanoscale, uh, there are uh, radios that are nano radios now that if you look at a penny and put a dot on Lincoln's eyebrow, that's the size of a nano radio. Uh, it does not have a battery, does not, it has about a kilometer transmission rate. Uh, University of Stan uh, Stanford University's actually prototype this. So these sensors will be everywhere. So what Anne was referring to in terms of a finite measurement of the atmosphere, there'll also be a finite measurement of everything that is geographically measurable and physically measurable on Earth, which is really the, the wave that we're capitalizing on in terms of providing data scientists and uh, space uh, experts that can uh, then convert that information to useful uh, solutions for the customers. Okay, thank you, Frank. Uh, uh, before we run out of time, and I would like to ask you, uh, uh, Planet IQ is building a constellation of weather satellites where I think uh, um, most of the satellites are government-owned and the conventional set of satellites. So how do you see uh, the data and the uh, uh, information coming from these small satellites, uh, weather satellites, would be fairing uh, vis-a-vis the conventional satellites? 
Well, I think uh, we have a couple of advantages there. One, um, there, there is a constellation on orbit called Cosmic One now, mm -hmm. which was a joint program with the Taiwanese government mm -hmm. and the United States Air Force and the National Science Foundation. Uh, the instruments on Cosmic One proved the utility of GPS radio occultation data to dramatically improving the forecast. Um, our founder built those instruments, um, also built the instruments that are on Cosmic 2, which will launch uh, next year in an equatorial orbit, uh, again through the country of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So we have um, the intellectual property, actually, uh, that has driven uh, the application of this data, GPS radio occultation data. So we know what we're building, and we're now building the fourth generation of this sensor. The quality of the data and the amount of data will be higher than anything any of the governments have ever seen before. We'll be measuring data off of all four GNSS constellations, so GLONASS, Beidou, Galileo, and GPS. And we'll have a superior signal-to-noise ratio over the previous instruments, allowing us to get down, um, way down into the troposphere to add to the surface of the Earth. 32,000 occultations a day equally surrounding the globe equals about 8 million measurements of temperature, pressure, and water vapor equally surrounding the globe. And that's the most accurate measurement of temperature that exists. So we're very confident that this will be the highest quality data anyone's ever seen before because this team has built 20 of these instruments on orbit. And, uh, and I agree wholeheartedly with Frank, it's not just about the data. It really isn't about the data. It's about the application of the data, whether you're in the imagery world or in the weather world. It's about helping society or business solve their problems. And we need to focus on those end use applications and a little less on the data itself. Yeah, I think you hit it on the nail. Uh, it's not just about data. It's about the applications and the use of data and information to create more uh, applications that would solve the real world problems. Uh, thank you, and mm -hmm. Thank you, Frank, for joining us on GeoBiz a live panel discussion on the small satellites. Thank you so much for watching us. Bye-bye.